I was born in 1932 and I was an only child. Uh, I had a lovely childhood. The area that we lived in was all open fields, so there was plenty to do as regards playing, haymaking, delivering milk by the milk can, uh, riding on the farmer's cart, the crumpet man used to come with the big basket with the crumpets and the bread. So I did have a very happy childhood. Um, the war started and so I was born in 1932 uh, and I was seven years of age, 1939, and we were uh, in a new school. It was a lovely school with a quadrangle, all brand new. And of course we all appreciated this beautiful new school where we could have maple dancing and enjoy the area that I lived in. It was a heavy woolen area, textiles, and it was a very good area, Bradford, which, you know, was a very wealthy town, really. Um, the school, unfortunately, at the breakout of war, we were told that we could no longer attend the school. We would have to go to the houses of the teachers. So the teachers made rotors out, and we went along then to the different houses to have lessons and we were taught knitting and of course the knitting was baraclavas, fingerless gloves, socks and we all were able to do this and taught along with the little bit of English or arithmetic that we did but we couldn't go in the school so it was all done in the houses. I lived in an area that was called Beacon Hill, Beacon Road and of course this is where they, let, they lit the beacons at the end of 1945. By this time they lit the beacons to say this was the celebration of the VE Day ending. The city was bombed twice. Uh, not our own area, but the actual city centre was bombed twice. Going from the first school, I went to the second school, which was a very much older building. And of course the air rape practices, we had to go down in the cellars, which wasn't very pleasant. As you know, we all carried gas masks. And if you had a special patent, black patent gas mask, you thought you were great. The others were just a canvas gas mask. The second school was a happy time. And of course we could attend school, having had the air rape practicing. So my memories of young people that lived in our area the road, was about five young men that joined up, they were all in the Royal Air Force. And of those five, there was only one young man came back. And in my years, I can still picture the young man who lived next door but one, a lovely looking young man, Hoyland was his name, and I can see him now coming across the field with his girlfriend on his arm, I can see it and picture it. Such a handsome young man. And they were so happy, so much in love. They were a lovely young couple. And of course, after that vision of him coming through the fields, which I remember very clearly, he died about a week later in an air raid. Well, he was a flyer, a bomber. And, he, and of course, there were three other boys. I think there were three that never returned. So it was a great loss, all of them. Came from small families, two or three in the family only. And of course, the leaving of those boys was a great loss to the families and to us because we knew each other very well. I went to school with the other young man's uh, brother. You know, it was a sad time. But we, we enjoyed ourselves. As young people, we could go out and play even though it was wartime. We could play and enjoy being able to play out with hopscotch and tins can squat, all the things that children were able to do in freedom, which I think a lot of children today don't get that freedom. We had youth clubs and we played table tennis and we played ordinary tennis. So our lives, although we were restricted to some extent, were more freedom than the children of today. So wartime memories, you know, rationing and being able to help mum 
make bread. Every Tuesday she baked bread and to come home from school it was marvellous to smell that lovely smell of homemade bread and a dresser top full of bread with tea cakes and loaves and still able to do that. And of course the food had to be, if we had stew, it lasted three, four days, but it was good food. And as I say, I really did have, I had cousins, no brothers or sisters as I've just said, but cousins that we could really share our lives with. Visiting each other, coming for tea, and of course a tin of Spam had to be cut so thin to go around the number that was sitting at the table. Corned beef was the main diet and, you know, but generally speaking, I think I can say there were happy times. Sunday school and youth club took over, but there was a sad part when you heard or read of deaths. Now, through the family, my husband's father was so keen on the British Legion and he spent hour after hour making up comforts from his parcels for the soldiers abroad. Into the early hours of the morning he would be wrapping up things that were knitted and gifts sent to the soldiers. And the letters he got back were treasures. He got so many letters back from soldiers that had received a comforts for the parcel. And so his thoughts were he got the kindness back in the letters. And although he worked and had to go to work in the morning after perhaps being up to two and three doing his parcels, he still had the pleasure of knowing that they were going to help the troops, you know, have a little bit of comfort, home comforts. Petrol was rationed and he, my father-in-law at the start of it realised that he could hide some petrol and dug up the garden and put these cans of petrol down in the garden. And then it came across in the newspapers or the radio, anybody that was hiding would the mainly get it up and cope with it. So it was a bit of a drastic thing that he had to then start and lift the petrol cans. And <laughs> He did get an allowance of petrol because he was a traveller, so he did get an allowance. And of course that allowance helped him. If troops were coming home on leave and they wanted picking up, he could do a little bit of help by going, you know, to pick the troops up. But that was his main reason. He was in the home guard as well. My father wasn't in the home guard, but of course being working in a mill, it was a textile overlooker, he then had to do duties, of course, for night watchmen. Well, what did they call it? If there was going to be any bombing through that night, they were on, on duty at the mill that, to sleep there. So that was his duties. He'd been in the first war as a grenadier guardsman, and, and he'd been injured in the first war. And it hit him drastically, the second one. And I think he had post-war trauma, uh, very much so. And he lived a bad life during that 1940 to 45, because I think he relived the trouble that he'd had in the trenches. He came back from the First War with fleas and all the things that were dreadful for them. And he was injured with shrapnel into his groin and had to go into Lincoln Hospital, even though we came from Yorkshire, that was the nearest hospital for the troops. So as I say, 40 to 45, he relived the, the time that he'd spent in the 1418 War and it really laid heavy on him.